Right, um, my name is Neve. Um, I work in the National Botanic Gardens just down the road, um, which is a lovely place to visit if you're looking for somewhere to go. Um, and I've chosen this topic um, to do on my lecture. First of all, I'd just like to thank the college and particularly um, Martin for inviting me. Um, it's a great honour to be here. Um, and I suppose the first thing to let you know about me is I love plants. I think plants are great. Um, I particularly like medicinal plants. Um, and I've just picked just a handful of ones that I think are kind of the more interesting ones um, to go through. Um, so unfortunately, I just need to scroll down here. Sorry, so I'm a bit stuck to the computer. Um, so I had to start somewhere. So I decided to start with the Sumerians. Um, the Sumerians are a group of people um, that would have been found in southern Mesopotamia, um, modern day uh, Iraq and Kuwait. <coughs> They're one of the first people um, to actually write down what they used to do, which is great. Um, so they had these great big clay tablets that they used to inscribe into. Um, <coughs> and particularly of interest for, for me, um, they wrote down different uh, herbal preparations. Um, now, they were big into magic as well. Um, and it's worth bearing in mind that some of these, these, um, uh, these types of people, um, spirituality was really very important. So spirituality and medicine really went hand in hand. Um, the common belief was that uh, sickness or illness was caused by bad spirits. So you had done something bad, you had displeased the gods, um, so that's why you were sick. Um, and people widely believed this. Um, so, as I say, a lot of the herbal preparations would have um, possibly they would have had an incantation written beside them, um, or they would have had to be um, mixed at a certain time of the year or um, when the, the stars are in certain alignment and things like that. So just that's worth bearing in mind. Um, they particularly revered the poppy. Um, as we all know, the poppy um, gives us some of the most uh, important painkillers of all of our medicines even today. Um, so I'm just going to talk about the poppy just a little bit. Um, next. Um, so the poppy is, is a beautiful flower. I'm sure you're all familiar with it. Um, it's an annual, so you can sow it from seed every year. Um, the Latin name is Papaver somniferium. Um, really nice name. And the, the latex really is, is what's synonymous with poppy. So um, latex is where we get our opium from. Um, opium was a big hit um, when it was first discovered, um, <laughs> as you can imagine. Um, probably, um, probably the most interesting use of poppy is, is the opium dens that, that came out in the early 19th century. Um, it has a very, very wide distribution, um, but the main area um, of cultivation was China. So a lot of the opium dens were run by the Chinese. Um, and just as I mentioned in, um, in today, these are the four main producers of legal um, morphine, um, which we also get from uh, the poppy. Um, so I was Googling pictures of opium dens and this was actually, um, I couldn't get one so I just went into town on Saturday, I got this picture instead. Um, but this would be one of the nicer opium dens. As you can imagine, they, um, they uh, dealt with every, members, uh, every, every type of society. Some of them are very squalid um, places, um, but a lot of them are very luxurious. They wanted people with money to spend their money there. Um, so this, this is kind of a nicer um, image of some of the opium dens. <coughs> um, yes. <laughs> um, and if you have questions at any point as well, please, please feel free to ask me. Uh, ask me. Um, so obviously people started to discover that opium wasn't really great for your health and um, that, you know, it went uh, underground in the early 20th century. It was forced underground. Um, but again, it was, still, it was still very much in vogue and people would visit Chinese businesses and go down to the basement um, and, and take their opium down there. Um, morphine, when it was first um, taken from opium, was hailed as a wonder drug. And we hear a lot about these wonder drugs. They were the new drug on the block. It was great. Um, it got rid of all your pain. It was brilliant. It made you feel great. Um, obviously, we know now it, it, it's not fantastic. And it was only after the Civil War, when about 45,000 soldiers came back highly addicted to morphine, that they decided, OK, maybe we need to um, do something about this. <coughs> so they decided to make a less addictive substance. And they came up with heroin. Um, so heroin, again, was the new wonder drug. For some reason, they seem to really enjoy giving children these drugs. Um, so heroin was sold as cough suppressant, um, particularly for children and babies, um, up until as recently as 1917, believe it or not. Um, obviously, we now know that that's not a great idea. What's interesting about the, um, the poppy is the three kind of main ingredients used in industry um, are morphine, which we know um, we still use in, in surgery, um, papaverine, which is used a lot in the pharmaceutical industry, and codeine. Um, and only interesting, I think was was it two years ago now, um, they decided to take all the codeine products off the shelves here because of their apparent um, dependency concerns. Um, but, but a very, very useful plant, um, just not 
probably used to its best um, in the past. Um, so the next group of people we're going to jump to, and I'm aware that we're jumping through history here a little bit, are the Egyptians. Um, very advanced, obviously. We know um, a lot about um, their plant use. But the most interesting thing that we've gotten from the Egyptians is this Ebers or Ebers papyrus. Um, it's the single most important medicinal document that we have. Um, they list over 700 different medicinal plants, different formulas. Um, and again, they, they have this great connection with spirituality. Um, so that, you know, this, this whole idea that sickness is a spiritual thing. Um, it's, it's a gift in some ways from the gods. Um, they particularly revered aloe vera. Um, I think everybody probably has used aloe vera at some stage. Um, very, very useful plant. It's a succulent plant, which basically means it stores water inside. So it has these lovely juicy or succulent leaves. Um, and if you cut into the leaf, you can see the gel. So it literally is 100% pure aloe vera gel in there. Um, <coughs> excuse me, synonymous with burns. Um, so that's probably the first thing that people will attribute to aloe vera. Extremely good for sunburns. Um, anything to do with the skin, really. It boosts skin's natural regeneration. So it's very gentle on the body. Um, it basically helps us do something that we do already. Um, and uh, now it's kind of coming into vogue. It's one of these, these new things that aloe vera juice is um, supposed to be great for you. It tastes absolutely horrible. So unless you really need to take it, um, I wouldn't advise it. Um, and in the beauty industry now, it's really becoming a big thing. Both Cleopatra and Nefertiti were, were big fans of aloe vera for its anti-aging properties. Apparently, they used to take baths of aloe vera juice and goat's milk. Um, I'm sure they smelled lovely after that. Um, but they said it gave them lovely youthful skin, which is obviously what, what you want. Um, and aloe vera is one of very, very few products that can actually be used on radiation burns. Um, so that's really great as well. Um, and it's perfect as it is. We don't need to do anything to it. Um, so we'll jump now again a couple of hundred years to the Greeks. Um, the Greeks were interesting because people like Hippocrates was one of the first people to actually think of sickness as a corporal uh, problem. So this idea of that, well, actually, maybe it's something physical, maybe it's something we're eating or something we're doing um, that's causing this sickness. Um, at the time, this was a very radical um, thought process. People were still very much ingrained in, in the gods and they prayed to certain specific gods um, to help them heal their sickness. So he was a little bit of a, of a rebel at the time. Um, but this is the first kind of scientific basis um, that we see in terms of medicine. Um, <coughs> <coughs> the Greeks were big fans of things like willow. Um, willow is a native Irish plant, um, Salix alba, white willow. Um, the active ingredient in willow is salicylic acid, um, which unfortunately is, is not very good for your tummy. So although people would take this medicine, they'd usually feel a lot worse before they'd feel better. Um, and it's because the, the salicylic acid really doesn't agree with us very well. Um, however, when it was acetylated, um, they came up with probably one of the, the most widely used medicines in the world today, aspirin. Um, so aspirin was, was invented in Germany. Again, when it first came out, it was this miracle drug. It could do everything. It could cure everything. But actually, it was just really good for headaches. Um, and the Greeks particularly liked it for headaches. Um, they, they said specifically for hangovers, it was great. Um, <coughs> so I'm sure we all can relate to that. Um, so we're going to jump again a little bit to the Middle Ages. Um, the Middle Ages was an interesting time because it's almost like we've taken a little bit of a step back. The Catholic Church now has, has become very powerful and um, it's gained a lot of followers and really it didn't want to go against the Catholic Church during the Middle Ages. So <clears throat> anybody who said, oh, you know, sickness is a physical thing. Oh, no, the church didn't agree with that. Um, the church said that sickness was caused from your sinning. Your sinning. Um, obviously, you're a bad person if you were sick. Um, and unfortunately, that's where we get a lot of these self-harming um, people. <laughs> which certainly did not help you get any better. Um, but the one interesting thing that did come from the Middle Ages is this doctrine of signatures idea. And Paracelsus um, was one of the people who pioneered this idea. And, and it was great because it kind of went with the church. Um, so his theory was that um, God has sent us um, signs in the plants as to what we should use them for. Um, so probably the most obvious example is the walnut, um, which looks a little bit like the brain. Um, so obviously we should use it for our brains. Um, and this theory at the time was widely accepted. It, it, was, it was very nice because it fit into the religious views of the people at the time. Um, unfortunately, more often than not, it was completely wrong. Um, most of the plants um, were horrible carcinogenics and had terrible toxins in them and killed a lot more people than they helped. Um, but every now and then he hit the nail on the head, <coughs> but just from pure luck. Um, and then the other idea we start to see forming is the idea of the four humours, um, which you probably have heard of. So um, this idea that once your four humours were in balance, um, you would be OK. And if one of them went out of balance, that's why you got sick. Um, and this is where we also see this very popular um, 
<coughs> surgical remedy of bleeding people and um, so that if your blood was out of balance the, the natural way to, to fix that was to get rid of some of it so they would bleed you and um, which is very helpful when you're sick um, there's two plans I'm just gonna just gonna mention briefly. Um, Wolfsbane, it's it's not it's not um, Irish, um, but it's a really beautiful plant. It's used a lot here, um, just in in borders because it looks very nice. Um, but it has its roots are are, are very magical. And um, so it's one of these plants that has has been used by many different um, cultures at different times. Um, very very toxic is worth noting that. Um, usually when a plant is toxic, it has some beneficial medicinal properties in there. Um, Coming back to Ireland, um, the only example I could find of it used in Ireland was that certain cultivars, the, the tubers actually look very similar to potatoes. And apparently we use that to our advantage here. Um, if a landlord was being particularly um, pernickety, um, peasants would often include um, an aconite bulb in the bag of spuds that would go up to the landlord in the hopes that it might land on his plate. Um, <coughs> and it would kill you very horribly and painfully, which would have been great at the time. Um, some of the other people that used it, um, the, the Chinese have been using obviously plants in their herbal remedies for centuries. Um, it's a very, very strong anaesthetic. It slows the blood, um, the pulse rate, sorry, um, very severely. Um, so they only use it in very small amounts now, um, but they do still use it. Um, the Nepalese and the Japanese tribes would have used it um, for its poisonous properties. Um, so they would have tipped their arrows with the juice of aconitum. Um, in a lot of cultures, it has this great link to werewolves for some reason. I don't really know why. Um, people believed if you were a werewolf and you ate some of this plant, it would cure you. And similarly, if you weren't a werewolf and you ate some, it would turn you into one. So it depends on what, what way you were feeling at the time. Um, during the medieval period, they said that if they tipped all their tools with um, the juice of the plant, it would protect you against werewolves. So lots and lots of connections to that. Um, and if you're up on your Harry Potter, it's, it's been included in Harry Potter for that reason as well. Um, and then another group of people that were into their poisons were the Nazis. Um, they had heard tell of, of these great properties, these great poisonous properties of the aconitum. And it said, although I haven't found any actual documentation to back it up, that they um, coated quite a lot of their bullets in um, aconite juice as well, because it's not bad enough to be shot by bullets. You have to die horribly from the poison as well. Um, the other one just worth mentioning here is Datura. Datura is a really interesting plant. Um, this comes from... Um, kind of South America, Africa, um, it's highly hallucinogenic, which is probably why we as people have used it for so many years. Um, <coughs> every part is extremely toxic, very easy to buy. You can buy it as a patio plant. Um, I don't know. I don't know why it's so easy to buy, but it is very easy to buy. Um, in English, it's known as angel vine or angel trumpet because of these beautiful white flowers. It does come in other colours as well. Um, but as I said, it's been used by different cultures um, for, for centuries. Um, one of the first groups of people to capitalise on it really were the European witches. Um, they were very much into their hallucinogenics, as you can imagine. Um, it would induce these visions. It it's very, very strong. So you would fly in and out of consciousness um, while using it. And um, they said that they would get these visions of the devil. They'd visit the devil. He would tell them what to do. Um, and as they flew in, a, in and out of consciousness, we think this is where the whole concept of witches flying comes from, is from this particular plant, um, which is quite interesting. You have very interesting images if you Google witches and Datura. Um, another group of people that have been using it for centuries are the Native American Indians. Um, they really like their hallucinogenics. Um, they used to use Datura and peyote, which is um, a, another succulent plant. Um, in a lot of their coming of age rituals. Um, so here we see, okay, it's not necessarily medicinal, but it's extremely important um, in, to the culture. Um, when you would come of age, you'd be given this mixture of peyote and datura, and hopefully the hope is that you would make contact with your spiritual leader or your spiritual guide. And this was very, very important because this was a lifelong connection that you needed to keep up. Um, so the idea is once you had made the initial contact, then every contact after that could be induced by the datura. Um, some other people that used it were some followers of Kali, who is a Hindu god, a little bit more of a sinister use. Apparently they used to poison unsuspecting travellers using Datura and rob them and then leave them on the side of the road to die, which is lovely. Um, and then the, probably the most sinister use of it is by the Haitians in their voodoo um, ceremonies. So they call it the zombie cucumber because it induces a zombie-like state. Um, and quite often, again, as a puberty ritual, um, young boys would be given it, and if they survived the ordeal, and um, luckily for them, they got to stay in the tribe. If they died, then they obviously weren't worthy. Um, they would also use it for um, 
unsavoury members of society. So people who weren't acting um, in, in a, a particular manner, they would basically poison them into submission. And um, so they would continue to give them um, the datura and basically turn them into a zombie. Um, so that's just an interesting one. Um, then we'll skip up to the Renaissance. Um, <coughs> really, the Renaissance is worth mentioning because this is where we first see dissections of bodies. Um, and this is quite important because up until then, um, people were uh, doing things like vivisections on animals. Um, so things weren't exactly where they actually thought they were um, because, you know, animals aren't exactly um, laid out the same as us. Um, and we have things like basic medicinal practices, like instead of cauterization, and um, so you can imagine if you have had a leg blown off in a war, you don't really want someone to pour boiling water on it um, to, to cauterize, or boiling oil, I should say, to cauterize the wound. It's probably not the best thing for you. So we have people like um, a lot of French surgeons would have pioneered sewing, so sewing up the wound and letting it heal naturally, as opposed to just cauterizing it um, with boiling oil, um, which obviously wasn't great. Um, <coughs> I don't... I've lost my, my slide to go with that. Um, and then we come into the 17th and 18th century. So again, just building on, on these ideas that have started to come to the forefront. Um, we first see inoculation, which actually um, first took part in Turkey um, in a very basic form, where um, uh, smallpox would have been the, the disease of choice at the time. Um, people would basically, if someone was infected with smallpox, they would cut you and, and rub the person's skin against you to inoculate you. And um, this obviously wasn't terribly successful. It wasn't the most... Um, uh, cleanly way or hygienic way of, of inoculation, but Edward Jenner um, did come up with a slightly more um, humane way of doing it. Um, and William Withering is another one, um, another man worth mentioning. He was an English doctor um, and he really used observation. So he was one of the first doctors where we see he actually for a second just stopped and observed things. Um, what are the symptoms? What, why, did, why did this happen? Um, what, why, what, what was the cause of this? Um, and foxglove was one that he was looking at at the moment. Foxglove was always um, a folk remedy, highly toxic again, lovely native Irish plant, um, but it was a folk remedy for almost everything. Um, in Ireland, apparently, they would uh, put a bit of foxglove in everything they ate and they said it would give you a longer life um, <coughs> or slowly poison you, one or the other. Um, uh, it has particular uh, cultural significance here with the fairies, um, so that is just worth mentioning. They said that the little marks on the inside of the plants here were made from the fingerprints of the fairies as they hid inside the flowers, so that's a nice one. Um, but really what he discovered was digitoxin, um, and digitoxin is, has a very curative... Um, it's very curative for the heart, um, and it's still one of the most widely used heart medications today. Um, so again, Folk medicine plays a huge part in, in our medicinal plants nowadays. Um, and really, I think more and more people are going back to folk remedies. And why do people use this? What, what was the benefits of this? Um, did they just come up with this notion out of their head? Or is there actually something behind this use of this plant? Um, <coughs> so as I say, heart defects and, and dropsy were the two main things that Digitalis was used for. Um, sphagnum moss is just a nice little one that I want to put in because it's Irish. Um, this is the thing that our bogs are made from and that our turf is made from. Um, sphagnum moss um, can hold up to 16 times its own weight in water. It's twice as absorptive as um, cotton and it has a penicillin bacteria present in it. Um, or palatinum fungus, I should say, um, and it's been used as wound dressings. Um, so here during the Battle of Contarf, the Irish used sphagnum moss to stem um, their bleeding. Um, it was a nice uh, pastime of ladies at the time to collect sphagnum moss and send it overseas to the soldiers as wound dressings. And in the far left-hand corner, you can see here um, um, an ad, um, an Irish ad for how to go about collecting and, and cleaning sphagnum moss. And the bottom left-hand uh, side here, we actually have a, a, a sphagnum moss surgical dressing. Um, and this is in our own collection in the Botanic Gardens. It's the only one I could actually find anywhere. Um, so it's just a little interesting one. We move up now into the 19th century um, and we have things, basic things like hand washing. So they, they suddenly realise that, OK, um, maybe if we keep ourselves clean and keep our patients clean, they have a better chance of, of surviving. Um, we see antiseptics, we see anaesthesia and all these type of ideas coming in. Um, <coughs> this is Joseph Lister and he was really one of the pioneers of using antiseptics in surgery and really, I think, saved a lot of people um, by, by doing that. Um, Chinchona is an interesting one. Um, they discovered that this powder that the natives were using was actually really good at curing malaria. Um, so they decided to bring it back to Europe. Um, but unfortunately, because the Jesuits were so hated in Europe at the time, a lot of people um, didn't believe them. They didn't believe that this was beneficial. Um, and probably the most famous example of that um, is Oliver Cromwell. Um, so Cromwell refused to be Jesuited. He didn't want to take this Jesuit powder. 
Um, so with the results, he actually died from malaria. He didn't die on the battlefield, he died from malaria. Um, <coughs> we have some original samples of Shinchona here, um, and then you can see up at the top of the Jesuits being shown by the natives. Um, and the story of, of, of um, quinine is, is a bit of a, uh, a crazy one. The, the Germans took, took over the Dutch plantations at one stage, and then the Americans had no um, Shinchona for their soldiers, and then um, they sent a guy out from the Jeffersonian to, um, or the Smithsonian, sorry, um, to try and find the original 17th century supplies. Um, he was very unsuccessful, and he was actually arrested by two German soldiers at the time, and he, he thought that this, this was the end of the game. Um, and they actually had smuggled out thousands of chinchona seeds that they wanted to sell. Um, so that was apparently the way that chinchona stayed in America. So it's, a, it's an interesting story. Um, the gum tree, or eucalyptus, I'm sure everybody has, has used this when they were, when they were sick. Um, <coughs> Eucalyptus gunia is Australian, obviously, and um, has this beautiful um, bluey green uh, sheen to the leaf, um, and the smell is from the volatile oils um, in the leaves. So that really gorgeous eucalyptus smell is from those volatile oils, uh, which is a defence mechanism, really, um, on a basic level uh, against predators. Um, some of the most, I suppose, synonymous products um, which use eucalyptus fix, vapor rub, and um, fisherman's friend um, was designed by a man called Joseph Loftus, who was working with Icelandic deep sea fishermen, um, and he came up with this formula, Fisherman's Friend. Um, but the first people, um, as usual, are always the natives. The Aborigines were the first people to capitalise on eucalyptus. They used to drink it in the form of tea, and they said, found it was very good for fevers, colds, anything to do with your sinuses, anything to do with your, um, your, your breathing was very beneficial. Um, and again, probably one of those things that we would just always use, because it's just so beneficial. Um, and then coming a bit more up to date, the 20th century, cocaine, great. Um, so cocaine was a big thing of the 20th century. Um, <coughs> it would, again, it was one of these miracle drugs, um, particularly for cough drops, particularly for children, again, for some reason. Um, we had all these great discoveries, we discovered the chemical structure, we were able to actually break down plant materials, we um, were able to start to think about synthesizing things, which is really great. Um, but we also had new diseases to deal with, so things like HIV and AIDS were, were the new thing on the block that we had to deal with. Um, cocaine is a lovely plant, very pretty plant, and it comes from South America. Um, I'm not going to try and pronounce the first uh, part of the word. I had it last night, but I'm not going to try now. Um, but the second part is, is worth noting. Um, so, I don't know what the first part is. Co coca, anyway, is the second part. So it's known as the coca plant. Coca leaves um, would have been chewed up. Um, and it is the strongest stimulant known to man after caffeine, um, which is an interesting one. Um, so we just moved down a little bit. Probably the most important thing that was made at the time from the cocaine plant was Coca-Cola. Um, so Coca-Cola Coca was brought in as a health tonic. Um, it included um, coca um, from the coca leaves, um, or cocaine, and cola, which was the caffeine additive um, from the cola nut, which is the same to African plants as well. Um, it, was, it was actually um, advertised as the intellectual beverage of the time. Um, so if you wanted really to be kind of very popular, you'd have Coca-Cola on your table. Um, it was the intellectual beverage. Um, obviously, when the, the, the issues with cocaine addiction came out, they decided, okay, we need to, we need to remove this. It doesn't look good for the image. Um, so they took the cocaine out. They left the cola, though. Um, but because the people were so synonymous with this product, they kept the, the, the Coca part in, in the name. Um, so that's why uh, Coca-Cola is, is named Coca-Cola. Um, or they say they took the cocaine out, anyway, I don't know. Um, <laughs> the other um, product was cocoa wine. Um, so cocoa wine, again, was um, a health tonic. It was for strengthening the body, strengthening the brain. Um, very popular um, among the aristocracy at the time. Um, so you have things like these lovely uh, Peruvian uh, cocoa wine, Bolivian cocoa wine, all this kind of thing. Um, and I suppose just culturally to mention the, the people of Bolivia and Peru, I think just recently have been, um, have been allowed to, to, to grow their own cocoa plants because traditionally they would chew them. Um, so particularly for, alt for high altitudes. So if they were farming in very high altitudes, um, it helps to alleviate altitude sickness. And apparently it is a cultural thing. Um, unfortunately, I haven't got to Peru just yet. Um, but they will give you um, coca tea um, as, as a welcome um, to help deal with altitude sickness. Um, okay. And then our last one is the 21st century. Um, so we're coming right up to date here. Um, <coughs> not too many mentions of plants, unfortunately, in this slide. Um, but we do have all these amazing new technologies now. So things we could never dream about before. We have robotic surgery. Um, thankfully, we have the smoking ban. Um, we have the human genome. We've done things we never thought we'd be able to do. But where are the plants? 
Um, so let's try and get back to the plants just for one second. Um, so the memory tree. Um, this is ginkgo biloba, and usually in the name there's, there's a giveaway in the name. So bi means two, and loba meaning lobe. So you can see it has this really gorgeous leaf down here in the bottom left hand side, an unusual leaf. Um, this is a really, really interesting tree. This has been used for centuries by people. Um, in China it's known as the memory tree. Um, genetically it's remained unchanged for the last 120 million years. So it has not changed, it has not adapted, and um, it hasn't done anything. It's remained exactly the same. It dates back to the Jurassic and um, the Cretaceous periods, um, so it probably would have been dinosaur food at one stage. Um, but that's really interesting. Something that hasn't changed has to be doing something right. Um, so people have started to study it. And in its most recent studies, um, they're looking at it now as a cure for Alzheimer's. Um, so ginkgo tea was always very popular, ginkgo tablets, and um, they say to the <coughs> students, same students in the audience, um, come up to exams, ginkgo tea can help with your memory and your blood flow, um, as I say most recently for, for Alzheimer's research. <coughs> um, pure ginkgo is very hard to get now because it's actually quite strong, so you usually get it in a mixed form, in mixed tablets or mixed tea. Um, and it's used for all sorts of different things, so um, things like Raynaud's, um, asthma, um, almost anything you can think of. It's just very good for blood flow. Um, so it's kind of a, a, an interesting modern up to date one. Um, that's pretty much it. Um, I'd just like to finish with plants are great. Um, <laughs> <laughs> there's a huge amount of them that we haven't even looked at yet. Only about 1% of the rainforest has actually been charted um, for medicinal plants. So who knows what's out there? It's amazing. Um, but yeah, plants are great. So thank you very much for listening. <laughs> Could we have questions now, please? Thanks very much, Steve. Fascinating overview. Yeah. Um, so, what sort of range of plants of interest are the botanics here? Would you have um, well, the majority of the ones that I would have mentioned would be found in the botanics. Um, if you do do a tour, um, uh, they're free on Sunday. Um, uh, the glass houses are just amazing. There is amazing stuff in that glass house. Um, a lot of the time, I don't like to mention a lot of the plants because I'm fearful that people might go home with some of them in their pocket. Um, but things like the datura is in there. We don't have cocaine, unfortunately. Um, it's it's too expensive to get the license to grow it. Um, but really, in, in the, the glass houses, there's just amazing stuff in there. And if you do want a tour, at least you kind of know what you're what you're looking at as well. Um, and a lot of the common Irish plants um, are, are very interesting as well. So things like your box club, things like your white willow, we have all of them in, in the botanics as well. Um, and it's a nice time of the year to visit as well. So. Yep. Um, I find that really interesting, thanks. And I suppose you've mentioned a lot of the um, herbs and plants that would be quite potent. Yeah. Um, but I'm also interested in um, other things that grow in Ireland and yeah. that have um, beneficial effects on the body. And two things that come to mind are like the nettle and yeah. the dandelion. Do yeah. you want to kind of make more, more information? Um, well, in terms of the nettle, I just know it's really um, a very good source of iron. And so for anemics um, or anything like that, um, what I would use it for in horticulture is as a, as a foliar feed, which doesn't sound very interesting, but it's a really, really good source of iron. So it's really good for um, all your leafy stuff. Um, but yeah, really iron is the main thing that you would use nettles for. And what I have heard, I'm just relating back to your comment about folk medicine. Yeah. And um, there's a folk saying, um, I'm not sure what exactly what it is, but it's like, before May is out, eat nettles three times. Yeah. And it'll be, like, or your system will be replenished yeah. for the years. Do you know anybody else heard that saying? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. I, I don't know the saying off by heart, but um, yeah, the younger the nettle, the more potent it yeah. is, basically, or the less um, bitter, basically. I'm just thinking of the, the folklore archives in UCD because they do an awful lot of cures and, and healers. Okay. And dandelion's yeah. a great cure for warts and stuff like that. But what yeah. did you come across mm -hmm. when we do some of the bog plants? Because historically they've been used a lot for by lay healers and everything else. Yeah, so no, not specifically because unfortunately our section of the box is very limited in terms of our bog plants, mostly because kids keep poking them because um, they want <laughs> to see the bugs come out and they die. So we, we um we only have a very limited um supply but no I haven't uh, sphagnum moss unfortunately is the only one that I've looked into in, in terms of bog plants. Sorry. <laughs> yeah. Yeah was well, first of all just to comment on what you said about the foxglove and the fairy yeah. was that I yeah. read that uh, foxglove is just a kind of mutation of folks glove, so it was the little people's yeah, gloves, yeah, yeah. first of all, and not, yeah. not really foxgloves. Yeah. And the second thing was just to say that um, 
I visited the Chelsea Physic Garden in London, yeah. which is brilliant. Yeah, yeah. And I saw on the news that they said they've just opened a herbal garden in St Anne's, and they said there hasn't oh, yes. been one in the Botanic Garden since it closed down. And I was going, why? Why is that? Or why yeah, was um, there one, and when did it close down? <laughs> there, there was one. Um, it's in, it's where the native section is now. Um, it was years ago, and I think really. The reason for us because they used to grow quite a lot of poisonous plants mm -hmm. and for some reason they seem to think that people are more likely um, in modern mm -hmm. times to take poisonous plants and um, so we do have a herb garden it's more of a traditional herb garden and um, so it's more uh, culinary herbs but we do have mm -hmm. we do have some we just we try not to draw too much attention to them and mm -hmm. um, because we have had plants stolen um, in the past um, and um, some of them are quite special and um, so some of them would have you know our gardeners would have maybe gone to Chile or gone to Bolivia and literally hand picked them from mountains and brought them back and unfortunately people steal them and um, so we try not to have that stuff out so much we do have a collection there but it's not on public view as such and um, just one more yeah. thing when I was on the Chelsea Physic Garden they told us a story about uh, I think it was an Irish doctor who worked in the Mayo Clinic many times years ago yeah. who had a brilliant um, cure rate with um, heart problems yeah. And that afterwards, his daughter revealed that he was using hawthorn. Okay, Did yeah. You heard this? Um, I have heard of I have heard of um, things about hawthorn. There's not a huge amount of documented evidence right. of, of what it was good for, what it was bad for. I think it was really just a part of of the Irish diet. Um, so people like, for example, my boss used to call, it, oh yeah, that's the bread and butter plant. So what? Um, so apparently they used to eat it as their bread and butter on the way to school. So they'd eat the buds and they'd eat the young leaves as their bread and butter apparently on the way to school. So um, I think probably it is an ingrained thing that it, that it has some benefit. It's, you know, it's medicinal, it has some, but obviously hawthorn hips are, are very good and hawthorn syrup um, can be quite good. But I haven't heard of anything kind of concrete. Yeah. Uh, that's that's it. Because it was a new one yeah. I hadn't. Yeah, no, no, I just, just the kind of folk element to it, that's all. Any more questions? Yeah. Thank you very much. A great presentation. You know, there's a lot of things like, for example, you eating nasturtiums and various other things like that. Yes. And they look pretty. Are they, good? are they any good for you? Um, I think they're horrible. I've tried nasturtiums. They're not great. Um, I, I, I don't know. I mean, every, every now and then something new comes out, so it's kind of, oh, a nasturtium is a salad, and it's great. Um, most of them taste awful, most of them are very bitter. You have to get them at the right time of the year. Um, and I think probably they are good for you. Um, any sort of any young plant will, will have all its hormones there, so um, you know it'll 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 do something good for you. Um, but a lot of them are undocumented, a lot of them are just you can't eat this, so why not, you know, kind of thing. But it doesn't necessarily mean it's good for you or it has any beneficial properties. It's just that it is actually edible, you know, you don't get sick if you eat it, so you know, but that doesn't mean it's beneficial necessarily. Yeah. Any more questions? When you were talking about the witches and they took these plants or whatever, yeah. did they know that they were the, the reason why they were having these? Oh, I'm sure they did absolutely they? did, but, yeah. But yeah. I thought I had read somewhere that you know, very often they were put to death or something, but yeah. that they hadn't realised that um, they had taken these. Well, I suppose they that thought was they a good excuse real. at the time, wasn't that? I, suppose, um, yeah. I had no idea. Um, Sorry, I'm just interrupting. Yeah. There was another theory about it. ergo of rye. Yes. 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 Yeah. Yeah. The bacteria. Something like. Yes. LSD. Yeah. Absolutely. That's where LSD is from. Yeah. Would not. Would be. Yeah. No. No. So that that was probably much more put down to yeah accent. Um. And then they just thought it was great. It was supposed to be some village, and there there was an invitation, and they all got the same. They called it Saint Anthony's Fire, but they were all. Yeah, no, well, I mean, certainly a huge amount of it is purely by accident, and you know, they, they realized okay, this is great, we'll keep taking it, or this is not so good, we won't do that anymore. Um, but certainly with the witches, I think they, they would have, I mean, really at heart, they were they were medicinal women, they were herbal yeah. women, mm -hmm. and they grew herbs for their for their restorative properties. And you know, to them, maybe we see a hallucinogenic as not a good thing and you shouldn't be taking it, but to them, maybe it was very right. beneficial yeah. in, a, in a different way. Um, but I, I'd say they, they, they seek out plants for those properties. Um, I can't expect this, I don't know. <laughs> um, so any more questions? Is there any evidence uh, to do with ivy leaves? There's a long history of in land of ivy leaves and holy water, say it's cures for warts and skin conditions. Yeah, um, not that I have come across personally. Um, the only thing I know that ivy is good for is for the bees, because the flowers really late. Um, but 
I haven't heard specifically. Um, there's lots of things connected with water, but I think really that was more just a cultural thing. Um, but you know, it's a native Irish plant, so if we put it in water, it has to be good for us. But I haven't heard anything concrete, to be honest with you.